once, it'll keep you logged in for the day until you turn your computer off. Yeah, so Chloe says that she copy and pasted the meeting ID and then Caroline says copy and paste ID from D2L to My Laurentian. Oh, that's how she got in through the My Laurentian. Huh. There's also just variation. Like I know the two labs, like I take obviously this class and then in my other class, it will sometimes Zoom will just randomly ask me to log in. So there's, in my case, like whether, because I'm the host for both, it doesn't, like there's no re like rhyme or reason. Some days I have to log in and some days I don't. Because I'll go to log in for the lab and it will need me to go through the whole rigmarole of logging in. And then other days it's fine. And I always use D2L for each class. Like I don't try to access it any other way. So yeah. I don't know why logins aren't even across the board. I don't know what the reason is. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. Who knows? So we're sitting at 61 now. Okay. It's 103. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, might as well get started. 62. Um, as co-hosts, the GTAs, you already have screen sharing ability, right? Pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to turn my mute, my mic off and turn it over to you guys. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about population growth. So we can get started with the um, PowerPoint, I suppose. Okay, so a bit of this is going to be a little bit of review from last week. So what is a population? Can anyone remember from last week how we defined a population? And a reminder, I can't see the chat. If somebody writes in the chat, please read it to me. <laughs> Isn't it a group of individuals from the same species living in the same area at the same time? Yeah, exactly. So uh, a group of individuals, the same species inhabiting a given area at the same time. Exactly correct. Um, so we have a couple of issues with this definition. So the first one is how do you decide what a given area is? Um, as was reviewed last week. Um, so the ecology of a system is very dependent on the spatial scale being studied. So the field of landscape ecology is primarily concerned with the effects of spatial scale on the ecology of a species, but you could look at much smaller areas or much larger areas, and that will definitely change what you're going to find. Uh, the other issue comes down to what constitutes an individual. So is it unitary or modular? So our one example of the trembling aspen on the lower left corner. Uh, so many plants are modular. So a single organism has multiple clones of itself, which can still be attached through a root system uh, to the origin plant. So a stand of trembling, trembling aspen in Washington state is considered by some to be the largest organism on earth, even though to us, it may look like a whole forest of trees. It's all still considered one organism. Um, our third issue is what constitutes a species. So there are multiple species definitions that I'm sure you guys have gone over in this class and possibly other classes. So there's biological, um, there's ecological, there's morphological, there's a lot of different ways that people can define species depending on what information is available about them. So our example that we have is our blue spotted salamander right in the middle. And it's representative of an organism whose species boundaries are not very well defined because they hybridize readily with a number of other mole, mole salamanders and they can steal portions of the genomes, incorporate them into their own. So defining it as a single species or determining what are subspecies can get really, really difficult. Um, our third example here, we have a nice little lock. So defining the given area using terms that are relevant to humans may not be biologically relevant. So what's in this lock or what's passing through here might not really be that relevant to the ecosystem as a whole, but it's a human defined boundary. So the question comes up of what area are we actually looking at for this population? So we have our characteristics of our population. Can anyone remember what the density is review from last week? Density of a population. It's individuals per unit of space. Yeah, the number of organisms occupying a defined unit of space. 
So you could consider that we have, I don't even know how many gnomes there are on that slide, but say 12 gnomes per square meter, and that would be our density. Uh, birth rate is pretty obvious. It's the number of births <laughs> um, and death rate as well. So our birth rate and our immigration add to the population and the death rate and immigration shrink the population. Can anyone tell me what an age structure is? Anybody? It's the percentage of age class in one class compared to the age class in another class. I mean, the yeah. percentage of that age class. Yeah, exactly. So like you could compare juveniles to adults or if there's separate, like say if you're dealing with humans, you could compare like infants, children, teenagers, young adults, middle-aged adults, and then the elderly, right? So it's comparing different age classes to one another. And that'll depend on what you're looking at, like what species you're looking at and what populations you're looking at, what would be the most logical way to do it. Um, and similarly, our sex ratio is the proportion of one sex to the other. Um, so the differences between gains and losses is the growth rate of our population. So, um, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk about the dispersion and biotic potential in these slides. So right now we'll start with exponential population growth. So in our example here, we have DN over NDT. So N is our population size and T is time. And the D, I'm pretty sure it's been, it's gone over, or Dr. Lisk has gone over with you guys about its change in time and change in population. Uh, that's what the little Ds represent. So our exponential growth model assumes that the birth rate and death rate remains consistent over time. So our, um, if you recall that R is equal to your birth minus your deaths, the rate of change is directly proportional to the population size. So R is constant. And since the birth and death rates are constant, uh, our R equals DN over NDT. So the results of an exponential growth curve as shown at this in this little graph um, is that if your births are greater than your deaths and R is greater than zero, the population increases at a faster and faster rate. So you can see all of our different R levels. I don't know, can you guys see my mouse? I point yes, to yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay, so yes, yeah, so you can see as your R increases, you're getting a greater and greater rate of growth. So here's a nice example of in reindeer. So this is a reindeer herd on St. Paul Island in Alaska, and it was introduced in 1910. So at the time of the introduction, the population consisted of only four males and 22 females. And in only 30 years, the population increased to 2000. So the population grew too large to be supported by the resources available on the island when we got right up around here. And so obviously they crashed. Uh, so this type of growth curve is very typical of populations that grow rapidly and exceed available resources. Uh, so for exponential growth, we're assuming that the per capita growth rate R was constant. Uh, so this isn't realistic as shown in this example for many situations because populations can't grow indefinitely. So the environment is not constant and resources such as food and space are limited, therefore causing these crashes like we were talking about. So as populations grow, we expect that intraspecific uh, condition resources will increase the death rate. So you'll have more starvation, disease, predation, and uh, the birth rate will then decrease. Uh, can anyone tell me what intraspecific competition is? Competition um, within a species. Members of the same species. Yeah, exactly. So it differs from interspecific where that's between species. So when we're talking about population growth and competition for resources, uh, as you guys know, different species occupy different niches. So intraspecific is very key because they're competing for the same resources. Uh, so thus your R uh, will decrease as your population size increases. 
So logistic growth, therefore, is density dependent. The more individuals you have competing for the resources, the more strain there will be on the population. Uh, so in a very small population before it grows, just like when we had the caribou earlier, um, your population size is a lot less than your carrying capacity. So your population size N right here is a lot less than your carrying capacity. And so if N is much smaller than K, then this N over K value is a very, very small number. And so one minus N over K is gonna be equal to almost one, right? So if N over K is 0 0.000001, you're pretty close to one with this whole circled area. So if one minus N over K is almost equal to one, your maximum growth rate, um, as defined right here, is gonna be almost equal to just your RM times N. So since our DN over DT is equal to RN, the formula for exponential growth uh, tells us that for very small populations, that the population growth is virtually exponential. So when you essentially, in other words, when you have a really small population, this is almost equivalent to, like this equation is almost equivalent to our equation for exponential growth. Um, but now if we consider a population at the carrying capacity, that means that our N value here is almost equal to K. So if N is almost equal to K, then N over K is almost equal to one. And so this value then becomes almost zero or zero exactly. So it's because it's multiplied by our, by our RM times N, um, this means that our carrying capacity and population growth is zero. So as you can see here, if you just look at this part of the graph, it looks almost exponential. But once you start getting those carrying capacity and those uh, density dependent um, or, or density influenced factors coming in, then you're starting to reach your carrying capacity. And so the growth stops. So our biotic potential. Uh, the maximum reproductive capacity of a population that is theoretically possible in an unlimiting environment. So considering we don't have any limitations in terms of food, space, shelter, anything. Um, so some of our limiting factors that wouldn't be considered, so our density dependent, so space, food, water, uh, and density independent factors, such as climatic events and the kill efficiency of individual predators. Uh, so climatic events can be anything from floods to tornadoes or even unusually high or low temperatures, and it affects the population size regardless of the density. So if you have something that's ectothermic that needs to survive, uh, it needs warm temperatures to survive, and you have a really unseasonably cool winter, a lot of those individuals may not survive, but it has nothing to do with whether there's a lot of them or very few of them. Uh, in in the same sense, our kill efficiency of individual predators uh, doesn't have an impact really on what the population size of the animal we're concerned about. Uh, so each predator has different capacities for killing prey, and some are better than others. So if your population happens to support a number of highly efficient predators, then that will be a limiting factor regardless of the actual number of prey. So our growth curves. So in a theoretical population growth is the growth that would occur if biotic potential of a species was realized. So i.e. if there were no limiting factors. A realized population growth, however, is the growth of the population that actually occurs in nature. So for today, our activities and our assignment, we're going to watch the crash course video number three in just a moment. I'll put it up on my screen and share it with you guys. Um, hopefully you guys have done the African lions population growth simulation and taken notes. And we're gonna discuss that in our individual breakout rooms. Uh, we also have two study questions about wolves and gypsy moths that we will discuss in our breakout rooms. And your assignment for today is to construct a figure based on the Yellowstone wolf data and hand it in by the end of the day today. So when you're doing your assignment, uh, please be sure to include labeled axes, a proper figure caption, a small amount of text explaining your reasoning for your population curve, and you can either draw it by hand or in Excel. Okay. So I'll just bring up the crash course video now, and or I will try to. <laughs>
and hopefully this will work. Let me know if you guys can or cannot hear the sound um, and I'll try to fix it if it's not working. Heather, we can't hear it and it's a little bit choppy, so I'm not sure that it's going to work. Yeah. Okay. So there should be an option that weren't we we were discussing that there's, there's a higher option. yeah there's a high scrub right there's a you can play a video I can't remember um, I think you can play a video at a higher speed or higher quality I think when you share your screen there's a button at the bottom of the window that you like press what window you want to share and it says like optimize for video sharing. Okay, and yeah, optimize audio and I didn't see that oh wait yes it's here let's try that again okay I think it should be optimized now so we'll try it again Alive on Earth was some kind of contest. Humans, I think, would win it hands down as a population of organisms were the Michael Phelps of being alive only we have like 250,000 times more gold medals. Last week we talked about exponential growth. When a population grows at a rate proportional to the size of the population even as that size of the population keeps increasing. Well since around the year 1650 the human population has been undergoing probably the longest period of exponential growth of any large animal in history ever. In 1650 there were about 500 million people on the planet. By 1850 the population had doubled to 1 billion and it doubled again Again, just 80 years after that and doubled again just 45 years after that. We are now well past 7 billion and counting. So think about this. Today, there are 80 year olds who have watched the population of their species on Earth triple. So why is this happening? And how? And how long can it go on? Because it's kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> Let's say you're shopping for dinner, and bear with me, we're going to relate it back to ecology in a second. But you got a lot of choices at your grocery store. You could buy five packs of ramen for a dollar, or you could buy some fancy ravioli made by Italian nuns out of organic pasta for like $20 a pound. They're both noodles, they're both food, but, you know, with the ramen you get more, whereas with the handmade stuff it tastes better, higher quality. What, what do you do? It's a perennial problem in nature and in our lives, satisfying the two competing impulses. Do I have more or do I have the best? Quantity or quality? Tough choice. Although we're not really aware of it, all organisms make a similar choice through how they reproduce. In ecology, we size up who chooses quantity over quality by something called the R versus K selection theory. The R versus K selection theory says that some organisms will reproduce in a way that aims for huge exponential growth, while Others are just content to hit the number of individuals that their habitat can support. That is, the carrying capacity, and then stay around that level. Species that reproduce in a way that leads to very fast growth are called R-selected species because R is the maximum growth rate of a population when you're talking math talk, as we learned last week. Very strongly, R-selected animals make a lot of babies in their lifetime and just hope that they make it. If some of the babies get eaten or something, no biggie. There are others where those came from. On the other hand, K-selected species only make a few babies in their lifetime and they invest in them very heavily. K in math language is carrying capacity since K-selected species usually end up living at population density closer to their carrying capacity than our selected ones. Of course, things aren't so cut and dry in nature as most animals aren't very strongly K-selected or are selected It's actually, you know, a spectrum. Some organisms, usually smallish ones, reproducing more on the R side and others, usually larger ones, on the K side. Most species are somewhere in the middle. So the reason I'm telling you this is to drive home how bananas it is that humans have gotten to the population size we have. Because we tend to reproduce way on the K-selected side of the spectrum. We're pretty big mammals, usually only have a few kids during our lifetimes, and those kids are a total pain in the butt to raise, but we put a ton of resources into them anyway. So even though humans reproduce K-selected-ishly, for the past few centuries, our population growth curve has been looking suspiciously like that of an 
our selected species. And exponential growth, even for our selected species, usually does not go on for 350 years. So how did this all happen? Well, the short answer is humans figured out how to raise our carrying capacity so far indefinitely, and we did this by eliminating a bunch of obstacles that would have made our numbers level off at a carrying capacity a long, long time ago. These obstacles, you will recall, are limiting factors, and we managed to blast them to pieces in a few different ways. First, we've upped our ability to feed ourselves. Our crazy rapid population growth started in Europe around the 17th century because that's when agriculture was becoming mechanized. And fancy new farming practices like the domestication of animals and crops were increasing food production. From Europe, those agricultural practices and their accompanying population explosion spread to the new world and to much of the rest of the world by the mid 19th century. Another game changer for the human population came in the form of medical advances. Anton van Leeuwenhoek, father of microbiology, all-around really smart guy, was the first modern scientist to propose the germ theory of disease in 1700, and even though it took about a century and a half for people to take it seriously, it revolutionized human health, leading to things like vaccination. Suddenly, people stopped dying of stupid, avoidable stuff, as they had been for thousands of years, which meant that everybody lived longer, childhood survival rates improved, and those kids went on to make their own babies and get very, very old. And we also increased our carrying capacity by not being so disgusting. We figured that you can't just sit around in your own poop and live to tell the tale, so sewage systems became a thing. In Europe, at least, it started around the 1500s, but they weren't widely used until the 1800s, and we all benefited from that. And finally, we've gotten a lot better at living comfortably in inhospitable places. That is to say, people have been living in deserts and tundra for thousands of years, but in the 20th century, we expanded the human habitat to pretty much everywhere in the world, thanks to heating and air conditioning and warm clothes and airplanes and trucks that bring food everywhere from Svalbard, Norway to New South Wales. So for all those reasons and more, humans have been able to avoid that old party pooper carrying capacity. Which is good, because I don't like it when people die. It's just, it's just a downer. And a lot of smart scientists and mathematicians and economists have argued that each person born in the past 350 years has not only represented another mouth to feed, but also two hands to work to raise the human carrying capacity. Just enough for themselves and a teensy bit more. So then as our population grows, our carrying capacity grows right along with it, like some really steep escalator going up in the ceiling just above our heads. And if it stayed there, we'd all get squished, but it keeps moving. But of course, this, this can't go on forever. The human population does have a carrying capacity. Capacity. It's just that nobody's sure what it is. Back in 1679, it was Leeuwenhoek himself who was the first to publicly hazard a guess about the Earth's carrying capacity for humans, guessing it to be around 13.4 billion people. Since then, estimates have ranged from 1 billion to 1 trillion, which is 1,000 billion, so that seems a little extreme, but the averages of these estimates are from 10 to 15 billion folks. And we need a lot of obvious things to survive. Food, clean water, non-renewable resources like metals and fossil fuels, but everything that we consume requires space, whether it's space to grow or space to mine or produce or put our waste. So a lot of ecologists make their estimates of how many people this planet can handle based on an ecological footprint. A calculation of how much land and how many resources each person on the planet requires to live. That footprint is very different depending on where you live and what your habits are. People in India use a lot fewer resources and therefore space than Americans, for example. Meat eaters require a lot more acreage than vegetarians. In fact, if everybody on the planet ate as much meat as the wealthiest people in the world do, current food harvests could feed less than half of the present world's population. So despite the fact that the Earth is a very big place, space is a real limiting factor for us, and as our population grows, there will probably be more conflict over how our space is used. For instance, if there really were a trillion people on the planet, everybody would have to live, grow food on, and poop on a 12 by 12 meter patch of ground, about half the size of a tennis court. So it could be that you could fit a thousand billion people on Earth, but I can guarantee that those people would have a hard time getting along with each other. But how about we stop thinking about ourselves j just for a moment. As we take up more space, we also leave less space for other species, and as we use resources like trees and soil and clean water, that reduces the amount available to all kinds of other organisms. This is why biologists say that we are currently living through one of the biggest extinction events in recent geological history. We're out competing other species for the very basics of life. And eventually, or in the case of oil and water already, we're starting to compete with ourselves as a species. So serious stuff here, but here's a little glimmer of hope. Unlike some other animals, a lot of our actions are based on a little thing called culture. 
and human culture has brought about some huge changes in the last 50 years. The fact is, even though the human population continues to grow, the rate of population growth actually peaked around 1962 and has been declining ever since. At its peak, the human population was growing at about 2.2% per year, and these days it's declined to about 1.1%, and it's still falling. Families in most industrialized countries are getting smaller and smaller. But why? Well, part of it has to do with women. As women in developed nations get more education, they're having babies later in life, and when an animal doesn't reproduce to its fullest potential, meaning it doesn't start having babies as soon as it's, like, sexually able to, that animal is going to have fewer offspring. Also, if you give women more choices and more education, they might be liable to choose a second career in astrophysics rather than becoming a mother. Another reason for the falling population growth rate has to do with the way that we live our lives. Back in the early 20th century, more of the world worked on farms and maybe ate their own food. Kids were a real asset to a farm back then. It's a good example of that idea about more hands doing more work to increase the carrying capacity of the human population. Yeah, kids were extra mouths to feed, but they were also a really important workforce, and you could just feed the kids the stuff you were producing. That's what we call a positive feedback loop. As the population grows, the workforce gets bigger, and the place, as a result, supports more of us. But these days, that's not happening so much anymore. More and more people are living in cities where you don't need kids to help with the crops, so fewer people are having them because A, they cost a lot of money to raise, B, they're not bringing in money like they were back on the farm, and C, a lot of people have access to good birth control so they don't have as many oops children. All these factors together are forming a negative feedback loop. The effects of reproduction in this case work to slow down the rate of reproduction. But just because our population's growth rate is decreasing doesn't mean that this juggernaut of humanity is going to stop anytime soon. In addition to reminding us that the rules of ecology apply to us just like any other organ Human population is important to think about because we kind of need to do something about it. And I think pretty much every other species on the planet would agree with me on that. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Ecology, and thanks to all the people who helped us put it together. If you want to review anything from this episode, there's a table of contents over there. And if you have any questions... Okay, so that was the video. And now I think all we have left to do is go into our groups. And keep in mind there their comments about human population growth because we will we will be discussing that in terms of the uh, gypsy moth example and the wolf example and kind of comparing human growth popular or human population growth to other species okay so you want me to start sending people over to their rooms heather uh yeah so i don't think there's anything else we need to discuss as a group Okay, so sorry guys. So those of you that came in early, um, you heard that the experiment we ran about getting people pre-assigned to breakout rooms didn't actually work despite my meeting with IT. So yet again, I'm gonna have to call out people's names and send them over to their rooms. But first I should send over. Oh, and we, we agreed that the um, assignment is due by midnight tonight. I think I said that, but just to reiterate. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is send the GTAs over to their rooms. So I will do that first. Oh, there's Brianna. Oh, Brianna left. I guess she actually went to her room. Well, that's cool. Um, just a quick question about what we have to hand in. I know we have to hand in a figure for the 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 wolf data, but um, under the gypsy moth problems, it says that we have to hand in our answers for that as well. So do you want us to hand those in, or is that just for our own? knowledge i think that could be um for discussion like if, if you work on it while you're in your breakout rooms and then discuss it to make sure everybody gets the same answers that would probably be really good yeah okay thank you yeah um sorry i'm scrolling through trying to find gta so heather i'll send you first to your room and looks like brianna already went to hers Okay. So, Natalie's gone to hers, so I need to send stuff to <laughs> Okay. I think the TA the TAs are all now gone. Okay. Um Adam Caleb. Brianna. Adam LePage. Yeah. Steph. Uh, Alex Weiss. No answer from Alex. Okay. Um, Alex Weiss is Natalie. 
Oh, Alice. Okay, thank you. Um, Allie. Heather. Heather. Uh, Amanda Smith. Steph. Steph. Uh, Amy Lemon. I think you're Steph as well. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Amy Meyer. Amy Meyer, are you there? I will check. Okay. Uh, Annalisa. Heather. Heather. Uh, Anish. Okay, nothing from uh, Ansonia. Brianna. Uh, Awab. I'm with Brianna, thank you. Thank you. Um, ben Demer, Benjamin Demer. I'm with Brianna as well. Okay. Uh, Benjamin Hatanaka. I'm with uh, Natalie. Natalie. Jackie, you uh, asked Amy Meyer? Yeah. Uh, she is with Natalie. Thank you. Uh, Anish, did you find, I didn't get an answer from Anish. Anish? Yeah, I'll Sethi. Find, what's the last name, sorry? Sethi. Okay, I'll find out. Thank you. Uh, Brooke? Brianna, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Cameron? Heather. Heather. Have we had enough insect examples for you, Cameron, so far in the course? More than enough. Thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carol Ann? Who had two, Carol Ann? Where are you? Brianna, sorry, Mike was malfunctioning. No problem. Not a problem. Uh, Charlie Morrison? Heather. And Anish, Anish uh, Sethia is, uh, Sethi, sorry, is with um, Heather. Heather, awesome. Uh, Sherry Lynn Andrews. Heather. Heather. Uh, Cheyenne Barnes. Cheyenne Barnes. Hello. Uh, Heather. Heather, awesome. Uh, Chloe. Steph. Steph. Uh, Colin. Brianna. Brianna. Uh, Daniel. Uh, Brianna. Brianna. Darwin. Steph. Uh, Emma Brown. I'm with Nat. Emma Jessup. Heather. And Emma Risto. Heather. <laughs> uh, I'll read. Brianna. Thank you. Uh, Amen. Natalie. Uh, James Barrett. Uh, Brianna. Brianna. Janine. Heather. Heather. Uh, Jenna. Steph. Steph. Uh, Jessica. Brianna. Uh, Johnny. Heather. Heather. Jordan. Brianna. Uh, Kaylee Lowen. Natalie. Natalie. And Kaylee Pollock. I'm with Heather. Heather. And Carrie Ann. Right, so, Tom, if you could check, check Carrie Ann Ritchie for me. Okay, I will. Um, Lindsay Van Dam. Lindsay is with Steph. And Luis. Heather. Ariana is with Brianna. Brianna. Yeah, so Johnny put it in the chat right there. So if you guys can get it from there. Um, Honestly, I would highly recommend all of the crash course videos. I love them and I find them really helpful for studying. Same thing, um, if you're having trouble, especially with math, um, you guys probably already know this, but in case anybody doesn't, um, the Khan Academy videos like K-H-A-N, very helpful, would recommend. But yeah, I love the crash course videos, like all of them. Not gonna lie, I like watch some of the, like the literature ones and the history ones just when I'm bored because I'm cool like that. And so there you go. Let 
We'll give it another minute or so because we only have 14 people so far. But Dr. Litzkis did say that somebody was missing, like they weren't coming, but I wasn't copied on the email. Speaking of which, um, so I had spoke with the TAs uh, probably two weeks ago now. Um, so if you guys hand something in late, like after 4 p.m., we've decided that it's a 10% deduction per day, but it starts like at four. Um, and if you submit something late, please email me when you submit it, because I don't like, I usually, I try to recheck the Dropbox, but I often forget. So if you um, do hand in something late and still want to have it marked, please email me. <laughs> and if it goes up to